So if I see somebody going or doing an isolated pivot drill with no club in their hand or their arms across their chest and whatnot, I'm looking at that and go, well, that's far transfer. You're, you're hoping that that's going to transfer into your game, but it has no context. So the likelihood of it doing it is pretty much zero. This is The Tournament Code. Before we get going, Stuart, I got to remind our audience about the golfer's agreement. You know, golf's a game of honor. And all we ask for us is, you know, we do this podcast for free. We love doing it. We love getting great guests on such as yourself. But we need our audience to make sure they subscribe uh, and leave a good rating on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. Or if they're listening on YouTube, to like and subscribe. This helps us keep this going. This helps us get on more guests. So if you're our, in our audience right now, it's not hard. I just beg you quickly, press those buttons. We'll get it going. All right. We appreciate you taking the time to join us, Stuart. We know some about you, but before we get to your coaching and teaching and playing history, let's go back a little bit to start. How'd you get into the game of golf? Really, my grandfather and my grandmother, they were the only golfers in the family. My dad never played, my mom. So I kind of followed that, really, and they got me kind of going. I was pretty young, like three or four when I first started, you know, going on the golf course. And I was lucky to have a golf course that was very, very supportive of junior golfers. So we had a massive junior section um, in a small town in in rural Wales, a place called Flandrindod Wells. And it was probably some of the fondest times I've ever had in golf. You know, we had so many different kind of players and friends from school. And we used to go up and hang out all day during the summer. And that's really how it got kicked off. And then you go through that progression, don't you? You get better, start playing higher level tournaments. And and yeah, so that's that's where I kind of started. So you got into tournaments too, it sounds like. And I know over... Uh, at least outside the U.S., a lot of times clubs have a lot more formal inter-club system for junior tournaments, et cetera, both intra- and inter-club tournaments, whereas in the U.S., it's a lot more, you know, there's various junior tours that you play yeah. on. Tell us about getting into tournaments and the development of your playing career. Yeah, I think it was just really, you know, at the club, you know, everybody wants to get their handicap down. You had certain, like, markers, you know, it was always like when you when you start, you know, you get to like a twenty eight handicap, and you're like, right, okay, my goal is now to get into the teens, and then it was like, okay, well, now I need to get into the single figures, and then I got to get into like category one at that time, which was under a five handicap. It's changed a little bit now, but the only way you could ever get your handicap down, you know, was playing in a in a tournament, so either a stable for tournament or a um, a medal. So the golf club always had them every weekend. The juniors were allowed to play in senior events as well. And we had our own junior stuff at the club. And as you kind of then progress, you start playing more county, you know, which is, you know, slightly further afield, playing against the better players in your county and then some national events and just sort of progressed that way, really. And then like everybody, you get to that point where you go, all right, well, you know, I might have a go at this, you know, but. For me, it was never I, – I went kind of into my PGA training early. But you still had to play to a certain level, you know, what and play certain tournaments per year as a as a professional that – because you couldn't you couldn't get qualified as, a, as a, uh, a PGA member or full member until you'd done that. So it's always been there, competition, but so has other sports as well. And that's uh, – and you said you wanted to become a PGA member, start teaching, et cetera. When did you realize, you know, hey, I want to I want to teach players uh, for a living? It was kind of a I, I was very fortunate. I did my PGA training um, at a golf club in South Wales. And the uh, when I went there and I started, I was kind of you still have the aspirations of playing. But just from a financial standpoint, it was just impossible. You know, I mean, well, I, I tried to have a little go at it whilst I was doing my PJ training, but that just wasn't for me. And I played, you know, an OK level. Um, but my got my boss at that time was quite a well-respected coach or teacher in that area. So we always had, you know, 
books around, like teaching books around and, you know, Rick Smith, like videos that you kind of watch and the kind of like, I'd never heard of these people before, you know, and you start to kind of watch them and you start, oh, this is quite interesting, you know, it's like, and, and it just kind of organically went from there. And really once I got cert, once I got past my, my PGA training and became a full member, it was then like, okay, well, what now? And I was kind of lucky enough to meet somebody who then recommended me to the Ledbetter organization, which was run by IMG at the time. But as part of that kind of education system, you had to go and get certified under that banner, you know, in America and whatnot. So that's when I kind of got uh, pretty close to Led. And at that time, you know, he's done so much for the golf instruction, you know, industry and, and, you know, promoting it over the years and, and whatnot. So it was like a dream come true for me to actually go over there, meet him, get certified. And then by the time I'm 25 years of age, I'm out coaching on tour. So it was a kind of a, a, a big whirlwind and pretty fast, to be honest. I'm not sure I should be teaching out on tour at 25 years of age, really, but that's that's probably for a, di a different conversation <laughs> hey the, it always takes the right things to happen you find some players that can trust in you and get a little bit of experience and find some good things for them and it can go it can go a long way obviously it sounds like tell us quickly about working with Ledbetter, getting certified there and what you learned because this obviously Ledbetter is a big figure in golf, but I, but more recently, you know, there's a lot more coaches that have a large profile, including him. But it's not like he has the a monopoly on the market or anything no, like that. No. Not at least not as much as he used he used to. For sure, yeah. Uh, and there's definitely a methodology and style that he had in his teaching. Uh, so tell us a little bit about what that was like going through that and what you learned. Yeah, I think that. One of the major, one of the big things that I learned, what you because you're around other coaches as well, you know, and there, so there's oh, it's for me, it it sped up my my learning because it was always somebody to challenge you, always somebody you could ask questions of, even including you know David himself, and you know it's funny because when you when when you kind of have set this perception of like how he how he is as a as an instructor and and whatnot but you know i've seen him give some of the most instinctive golf lessons ever that go that are nowhere near you know what his what you'd see as his met his method you know it was and then i've seen him give him a, a different ones you know so he, he, sometimes you get he got a bad rep of certain things but he for me I, he was always amazing i could always pick up the phone to him and ask him certain things but it was during that time when I just come out of the organization and I was but I was still quite close to him that I got kind of disillusioned by what was going on not not from that organization just in golf instruction because you know it was like all well, about a tour event or with a player who's playing professionally and you're trying to change them like you know mechanically and or trying to change their technique and you can see that they can do it and whatnot and then you go watch them play on the golf course and they're just doing exactly what they've done before and they're not really improving and then some of their technique was improving because they were consciously thinking about it you know a lot and then they, their performance would would be terrible right and so i'm kind of like quite reflective in quite and quite hard on myself when it comes to this stuff and i'm like there has to be more to this you know it can't be just this right <laughs> And it was kind of because of that kind of that uncomfortableness in me that I started then, I don't know whether things show up, or I started opening my eyes to different things, but I went to a seminar um, at the Belfry where the, the PJ headquarters are in the, in the UK. And it was a gentleman called Graham McDowell, not the golfer, he's a, got this a golf coach. And he started talking to, you know, this, this lecture about like constraints they're learning and, ecological dynamics and things and i'm going oh my god like what is this stuff you know i how have i not heard about this and that sent me down this whole path of motor learning you know really how to how to apply the practice 
to improve somebody. And that's really kind of the space that I'm in now. I, I would class myself as like a practice coach. I help players that I work with use their time better and to actually look, help them, you know, shoot lower scores ultimately, because that's really what it, what it comes down to. But I think if I'd have, what it, what it kind of got disillusioned me was I was, you know, going through this whole journey as a, as an instructor and I'd never heard of these things. I'd never heard of motor learning or um, motor control or, or whatnot. And I'm thinking, how is this possible? You know, when we're, we're in a sport where we're, you know, we are trying to move an implement and move our body to propel a ball, you know, into orbit. So how have I not? And and that's kind of what I'm trying to do now. I'm trying to bring more of this stuff. I'm in the process of doing a doctorate at, at the University of Limerick um, and trying to pull this all together to actually bring it more into the into the market and get people to kind of understand a little bit more that it's not just about changing somebody's technique. There's a there's ways of doing this to actually help them probably perform at their best. Yeah. And it sounds like from what you were saying with being disillusioned is that overarchingly the industry was making trying to make people's swings look better and maybe they were succeeding. Maybe maybe they weren't. But when competition came around, obviously the swings reverted more and more to a what they were like before and b if they were making the swings better especially at that time probably without track man et etc like you can make positive changes but you're not necessarily getting exact feedback on what's happening at the ball uh it sounds like a lot of the changes when they were making them weren't helping them play better golf because and, and it was kind of changes- it was just con- yeah and it was contrived you know it was just and you could make them you could make anybody look different but it's it's the way of you know can they look different and perform is that is that change actually helping them improve you know their golf and their scores and that's really the kind of the rabbit hole i'm down you know right now is that you know i have this pretty much underlying question of if a, if a player you know reached out to me and they start to want to improve their practice or whatnot my first thing is looking at, you know, what they're going to do or what they are doing and just going, well, how do you know if this is going to transfer? Because if it's not transferring, then what's the point in doing it? It's really as black and white as that. So when we look at the history and we've got, and I've gone back and I've looked at certain things for within, within my doctorate, you know, if we look at golf instruction, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, into the early 80s, a lot of the golf instruction books and things were done by old wood players, really. And they always had a club in their hand and they were always moving the club and trying to propel the golf ball. And at some point when video camera came in, you know, we, we started making movement into what, what I call postures. You know, they're just moments in time, right? And we start you know, segmenting everything down and we start coming up with like drills that we're looking at where there's these two things in transfer. There's near transfer, which is a movement that is kind of similar um, or the same as what you're going to do when you get out on the golf course. And that is highly contextual. And then you have far transfer where it's a movement or something you do which has no context and you're hoping that we get transferred down the road, but there's just no evidence for that as, as, as I sit here right now. So when I look back at it and I look at the history, we've, there's this, this thing called path dependency where we've adopted th- certain things and we haven't challenged them. And that to me is a, is an issue, right? In, in golf coaching and, and when we're trying to help these players. So if I see somebody going, or doing an isolated pivot drill with no club in their hand or their arms across their chest and whatnot, I'm looking at that and going, well, that's far transfer. You're you're hoping that that's going to transfer into your game, but it has no context. So the likelihood of it doing it is pretty much zero. Yeah. Let's, let's pick on that drill and dive in a little deeper on something like that. Because that, dr- that drill that you see, like golf club across the shoulders and turning – that's probably one of common drills. That's a that's a very common one, and at least what I've noticed in something 
when I've done something like that and then compared it is, yeah, with like all things being equal or in that context, of course I can make a full turn or something like that. But once you get the golf club in my hand, I'm reacting much differently and the constraints as far as how, how far I can turn and how far I can functionally turn are significantly different. Tell us why. So it sounds like you're saying a drill like that most of the time might not make sense if I, and let's say with that drill in its context, I'm trying to make a, the goal is for me to learn what it feels like to make a full turn and also I wouldn't say resist against myself, but make a full turn while not like uh, moving my center of mass too far to the right or too far to the left too early. What sort of drill would you recommend in that case that would have, as I believe you call it, as it's called near transfer as opposed yeah. to. Yeah. So, you know, I think that, you know, to have something like transfer and have a feel, right? They're, they're somewhat related, but they're kind of disconnected as well. It like feels change all the time. They can change in round, you know, they can change just within this, from day to day, month to month. You know, when we search for these same feels all the time, we're kind of doing ourselves a disservice. We need to just let almost feels like emerge almost. Whereas when it comes to that actual exercise, you can do that and get a feel at 100%. But to actually get it to transfer, you need to have your club in your hand. You need to really be hitting the ball and you need to have some kind of sort of target or shot in mind. And then, and this is the hard bit. Okay. So I think that drill is, um, is more for the coach than it is for the player. And I realized that in myself. Okay. So this is not, I'm not bashing anybody, please, you know, that, that uses this drill. I'm not, but I can make somebody you know, get a different image, right, or whatnot with that pivot. I can film them, whatever whatever I need to do. If they're on force plates, you can make things look different, n no problem. So I think that's more for us, right, when we're seeing that and we can show that to the player. But actually, we, we don't want that. We want that player that when they go away, right, that they don't have to stand in front of a mirror and just, you know, drill the hell out of this because it's unlikely that's going to work either. It's having a way of doing that, that movement that you want whilst they've got a club and a ball or they're making some kind of like full motion golf swing. It takes a little bit more time to find some sort of cue or some sort of analogy that the player can, you know, that, 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 that works for that player. And that's really the coaching art for me. So it's a little bit harder to find sometimes. Like you could say, like you could use cue and tape, right? And you could say, well, what I want you to do, I'm going to put a bit of tape on your belt loop or your belt strap or your belly button or whatnot. And I'm going to put, you know, a piece of a colored tape on your right shoulder. Okay. So what I want you to do is keep that piece of tape this way so it doesn't move over here. And I want you to get that tape behind your head. But you're actually doing that whilst you've got a club in your hand and making some kind of movement. And then you start to get feedback. So then you you as a coach is looking at that and going, okay, well now we're starting to see, or oh, we might need to alter it a little bit. You know, are you getting it? Like from the player's perspective, do we need to give you an analogy like a corkscrew or something like that, you know, to enable you to do that? That to me is the, really the art of coaching. And that has a higher probability because what you can do then is you can actually take that individual on the golf course put them in different lies, different situations, because doing that same kind of exercise, because the brain and the body need to know that I can make this movement in different environments. Otherwise, it's going to realize and say, oh, I can only do this on the range. So we need to move to, to different things, different targets or whatever it might be. The uncoolness of this, or the more difficult thing of this, it's not that it's not as easy as just giving somebody a pivot drill. It, it is more challenging to find the right type of coaching cue or 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 something for for that player. But it's well worth doing it, to be honest, because it has higher benefits.
for for that individual. And, and what and thing is, what it does is when you start to look at and you start to see certain drills, and you go, okay, well, that's far transfer. That's that's more near transfer. Okay, that's that's beneficial. Let's just throw that one out. That's not really doing anything. So we start to streamline everything down and become more functional and just getting more out of their practice time, basically. I think that leads us to a good question as far as mere drills and everything of that nature. So one of the things you said earlier is but when we take uh, these videos and we've reduced things in some way, it's helpful, you know, P1, 2, 3, 4, 5. It's somewhat helpful at least to compare points in time. But also that's exactly what we're doing is comparing when we take something, we just look at where someone is at P5. We're just looking at where they are in a point in time. And what we might be missing is what got them to that point in time. So if I, if I'm trying to match up with, say, if I'm trying to match up with Victor Hovland's swing at like P6 or something like that, I could. Go, I could swing up and then I could try to contort myself and maybe a mirror or something like that and be like, all right, here, here I am. I've matched up with him in P6. But really, if I ever tried to make that swing, if I really ever tried to get there, it might take a lot of work because we're, we're not just reacting to, we're not just moving around in positions. We're reacting a lot of the times to where the club face is in space mm-hmm. and we can intuitively feel where that is and know or at least have an idea of how we can square it up. And so 100%. When, it, when it comes to something like mirror drills or working in a mirror and trying to, what I might say, hit positions, how do you balance, how do you balance, you know, trying to move into functional positions while also not getting necessarily caught up in the positions themselves? Yeah, it's a good, really good question, and it's something that you know I've bounced back and forth with with a few people in my kind of circle. We've kind of spoken about this, and so so the the I think the basic premise is there's nothing wrong with like doing something like that to get some to build some awareness of you know what you're trying to do ultimately, but but to really practice it. It needs to be to have to be effective. It really needs to be done in full speed, right? So if you're if you're slowing if you're slowing the swing down into like frames, and and I think that you know that P one P two, I think that's a really good system from a communication standpoint between student and coach because there's always a reference point where if you're just on the phone to somebody and say, okay, well we're you know where is it at? at p5 or you know what's the club face doing at you know p6 or or whatever and it instantly gives a reference point for that for that communication and to cut through through all the stuff but if you're going to actually start going okay well i'm going to slow this golf swing down you know like they i think it was in one of the books like the talent code or, or something like that where you're making really slow motion movements well this you lose the specificity of the movement so it's just completely void because you don't you're not moving the club in that ratio of time and, and space and the tempo element it's just it's completely different you know and if we kind of stripped it back and we kind of met and we put somebody on a 3d motion system or whatnot or and force plates you'd even start to see you know different loading patterns and and you know acceleration deceleration deceleration properties that are probably not even anywhere near present in the in the full movement that you're making so it's okay to do it to get a, a reference or get an awareness of what's doing but to really practice it you've got to be able to do that in in full speed to to be for to be full effect fully effective so that's why it it takes a little bit of time to get somebody to you know, there's a there's a, a thing called differential learning where they're making all different kinds of movements, right? So we're almost like building up references in space, almost like putting the bumpers on the on a bowling lane, right? So you're trying to find that that sweet spot in there. Whereas if you don't have the bumpers down and you're trying to just go straight down, 
that that ball can go anywhere, right? So what you're trying to do is you might say to a player, okay, well, we kind of know where we want this club to be. I think, you know, this is going to help you either get more speed or more on center hits or, you know, whatever it might be. But if we look at it here, you know, what, what's your awareness of what's going on there? Where is it? Is it you know, from a scale of one to 10 to where we want it? Oh, it's a three. All right. Okay. Well, what if you go to 11, right? What if you start to, you know, throw it down there and then you almost like start to feed the error as well. So you're starting to do extremes and that starts to build up again, a reference for that individual to go, okay, well, when you're going to do this now with a ball at full speed to that target, I want you to do as much as you can, okay, of what we're trying to do here, like a, like the old school exaggeration, but you can't just say exaggeration because they need to know where the club is in space. So they need to have those bumpers up. So they need to know where they are within different parameters. Does that make sense? And then you start to get that feedback. So then you can start to use a video camera or whatnot and go, okay, if that's a 10, let's, let's get some reference and see where it's at. Okay, great. So we can see that's, that's much better. It's much improved. Brilliant. Let's see if we can do that a little bit more time with change club. Can you do it with different clubs now? You know, strike the golf ball. And we start to build that up. And once they start to see, okay, we get, we're getting there now. Next lesson, you come in, you don't even say anything. You say, okay, can you show me this, this swing to that target? And you get a reference. And you see where that play is at. Oh, this is improving. Like, look at this. Okay, let's go and play a couple of holes. Let's go and see if we can do this now on the golf course. And it's, it's a process. Do you know what I mean? It's not... Yeah. To coach somebody to do something, you know, that's going to improve their golf. It's not just going in and going, yeah, we'll give them this kind of easy drill and whatnot, and they're going to go away thinking that they can do it. It's not about that for me. It's about this that process over time to say, right, we want to kind of get this kind of closer to um to transfer into the golf course by this time. So you know, can we do this? Yeah. That that makes sense as far as having those constraints and working through it over time. One thing I wanted to jump back to, is you mentioned uh, the talent code and slow motion swings. And I think that that's something that is that kind of teaching is common in golf. And so I think I'm going to let's dive in a little deeper on that. And I'll provide the audio audience with the background, at least as I remember it, it's been 10 years since I've read the book. So I don't, yeah, me too. I don't fully remember it as I remember. So Daniel Coyle was the author of the talent code and his quandary. It's, it's partially an anecdotal book with some scientific backing as well. It goes around, tells stories, and then there's an overarching theme to the book. And essentially what Coyle does is he goes to uh, a bunch of different unique, uh, high performing areas in a variety of sports, academics, et cetera. So he goes to Brazil and tries to figure out why are Brazilians so much better than everyone else at soccer. It's it's not something necessarily genetic because that's not an evolutionary trait you would really pass on no. to your kids. Uh, it's not necessarily because they get into the game so young because you can start plenty of kids at that game young and it doesn't make them special. Uh, and so for something like that, he's what one of his points was is as far as developing uh, when it came to Brazilians it came to developing skill. They played a smaller form they of played foot, uh, futsal, didn't they? Yeah. A, yeah. A, a heavy ball. So it was on the ground more. Yeah. It wasn't a smaller, bouncing around everywhere. Smaller indoor. pitch. Yeah. Yeah. So exactly. They have, and, they have more touches and, and, and so they, so ultimately there's a, there's constraints on, on the environment that kind of helps them. You know, they played a lot more street soccer as well than, than a lot of organized, soccer where again you have to learn to control something because it's because you're on dirt basically yeah yeah um, I yeah think it exactly kind of to that wasn't it yeah he so he looked there then one of the one of the groups he looked at was uh uh some high performing musicians and looking at studies that as far as training in musicians as far as who could pick up music faster like for kids who could pick up music faster and again, looking looking at how they practiced it, et cetera. And a lot of it, and that's where the slow motion comes in um, because that was evident there and a few other places was his, one of his theories was 
So when you look at a brain, I'm going to try to dumb this down because only because I have a dumb understanding of it. When you uh, look at the brain, you have synapses that help send electrical pulses around and you have message messages essentially that go through your brain. So like me moving my arm up and down right here is a series of messages being sent through my brain. And the reason I can move my arm up and down pretty like speedily here is because I've I've sent that message a million times. My brain knows how to send that message. And when that message is being sent, uh, and when you get better at sending a message through your brain, this thing called myelin, M-Y-E-L-I-N, the myelin sheath wraps around that uh, circuitry. And so it helps, uh, if you think about it, like um, the conduction of electricity, it helps the electricity get conducted faster and faster. But when I have a new movement, uh, like a, re- a really new movement, or at least a new movement under a uh, strain, which you might think like, okay, I can do this, but can I do like, like sw- if for people yeah. listening, like moving my so, arm so in a adap- really like weird way. Like, of something. Yeah. Yeah. Can, can I do, can I do that? While some things are muscle dependent in part, what his theory was and what's at least some data shows is because that, because the, there's not much, the circuitry has not had that much myelin used on it was what we, we might call muscle memory, but your muscles don't remember things. Your brain remembers things that, that memory, uh, when you're trying out new movements and you can think of this in a golf swing, if I'm used to swinging like Victor Hovland and then I swing like, uh, try to swing, swing like Matt Wolf, it looks a lot different. My movements are extremely different. If I try to do that in competition, I could think that, but I wouldn't be able to recreate it in part, in part, he, he would say, because I have not essentially used that circuitry enough to get the get enough myelin on there to be able to fire it fast to fire that circuit fast enough and then as well you have this issue again from this is just from the book that and I'm, I, I promise I'll stop rambling and get your comments on this in a second but like in the book that another reason that may we revert back to in in the case of golf uh, it would be applied there but you revert back to swings uh like older swings etc is not just pressure in part and because you want to rely on what you know, but it is because that's what you know. So you can try new movement patterns, but your brain might route what I would call those route that energy or not. That's not the right way to phrase it. But if you think about it, going through a maze, your brain might start going through the maze and then find the route that it knew the best previously. And so that, that was his, part of the point of the talent code and part of what he argued in there was all right because we don't know these things intuitively or because we do not have not practiced certain skills enough we need to first try them in slow motion and slowly build that what i would if we were thinking about going through a maze we slowly build that route through the maze get our memory of going through that maze better and better and then as we do that we can run through the maze faster and faster and what it it sounds like from what you said earlier is that maybe maybe that's not maybe that's not necessary the slowness or too much slowness is not necessary kind of tell us a little bit more about what you've learned or understood as far as moving moving slowly in what i would call slow motion drills in order to build in those or i could have taken misunderstood yeah. no it's it, it is that and i think the 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 biggest challenge I have with with that, um, I mean, I mean, myelin is is an absolute thing. You know, it's not like, but myelin is also built up, you know, from when you're a kid and you're doing loads and loads of different sports. You know, and that becomes then you become an adaptive system, right? So people who usually play good sports can, or a number of different sports, can usually transfer that kind of skill into something else, right? So there's clearly developed myelin sheath around the neural networks, right, from from when we're a kid. Now, the, then the thing that, that I struggle with, with that is, it's like it's more like an analogy, right, that gets people to understand things potentially. Where I, I'm, I struggle to think of is that like, we have this, this 
path, this neuro, neural connective path that is for a golf swing, right? That we kind of build this sheath around this one thing for a golf swing. I just don't think that that's, that's the way it is. You know, I think we're trying to coordinate a number of different, you know, degrees of freedom for us to, to swing a golf club. So I think that there are, I think it's a, a really, really nice story, but I'm not sure it does potentially what it, what it says. And, you know, I'd love to hear some stuff that, that, that contradicts that, you know, and, on, on where my belief system lies. I just haven't, found it so somebody does know about this then please like let let me know because i'd love to read it i i just think that when we're looking at you know a, like a a movement system we're trying to coordinate a lot of limbs and whatnot to to strike a golf ball we want to try and keep it as contextual as possible and the movement as specific as possible to what we're actually trying to do and i think like i said you know, I was speaking to like a, a, a network of friends who are way more high, more read than me on, on motor learning. But they said, yeah, it's okay. You know, you do a slow motion swing to find where you want to be in space, right? But to re, but to continue to do that, to, to well, like, like grind in a pattern, I just don't think that's how we work. I don't. I think we're adapting to, in, to environmental things a lot. Um, I don't think we have one pattern. I think we have we have a innate variability in how we move, and that is that is as we sit here, that's pretty factual, and that's a lot to do with the energy system in our body as well. And we need to adapt to different environments and different situations. So if I look at that and I look at how variable golf is, golf is not as variable as soccer, right? Because there's a lot of different moving parts going on in, in soccer. Golf is not as variable as that. We have some variability in there because we need to hit maybe different shots and different flags, different lies, et cetera, et cetera, different visual constraints that we have. So we don't need to have that, that necessarily that dynamical, as much of a dynamical system as what soccer would be. But we do still have it, you know, and we still need to adapt our movement to, to do different things when we're playing. So to train just one movement in slow motion with that essence of trying to groove in a pattern, that goes against the context of how the game is played. So that to me doesn't, it doesn't make sense. You know, from I'm trying to do my job to help players play better golf and shoot lower scores on the golf course. That is the role. So I'm not trying to help them have a, a change or a better pattern per se. I might be trying to get them to access good stuff more often, right? So we're trying to raise the floor of the player rather than necessarily make things overly better. We might be trying to make things a bit tighter, right? So that's where that thing misses me. I don't, I can't see... I can see the relevance and I can see the value in those doing that slow motion stuff to get an awareness. I can, like to get a feeling or whatnot, but it needs to be trained. It needs to be really practiced in context for it to have a big impact on, on playing. Okay. I'm going to try to break down what you said for, for what I think you said, just so I understand it. And so that to make to make sure that I'm on the same page because I don't I'm not I'm not necessarily disagreeing or anything like that. Essentially, if we because you talk you say we use analogies because it makes things make sense for people, which is true because otherwise I probably wouldn't be able to understand this very well. But if you take if we go with the like a a ma if we go with the maze analogy or something like that, and I'm in my head I'm thinking of like a cornfield maze. You know, there might be one path through, and if we're th and our motor pattern is not really it's, it's not, not following really one, one it's, path it's not That's one right. path there's like no. five different paths that all over let five different paths they all overlap and then they all have five separate exit points to the maze and those more than that but that those five separate exit points in this analogy would represent would represent maybe five different outcomes with a golf swing, but at the end, but at the, 
the end of the day, if we do slow motion on like we can go slowly through one point of the maze or something like that to try to remember it, but uh, just due to innate human variability, we might enter the maze at a different point each time. And if we enter at a different point, then there's going to be a different set of stimuluses or something that we're reacting to. So we can we can try 100%. to go slow motion. We can try to go slow motion through one path, but in invariably we will get off that path and find our way out. And so it's if unless we practice in in fast in more real time, et cetera, like we get the feel and then take that and try to implement that feel in real time, et cetera. We don't know whether we can perform it. And that's similar to something that uh, Ben Shear had said. He's, I think his episode dropped a few weeks ago. And he was talking about when he was doing the analysis on players as far as their fitness goes. He's like, yep, all right, they passed this, they passed, tick this box, they tick this box. All right, they, they are, they should be able to do everything we ask them to do. They're, as they, there's golf handicaps or fitness handicaps sometimes. And, he didn't use this, but like, let's say, okay, they're a plus one fitness handicap. They should be pretty good to go. But then you get them somewhere in their swing and uh, that system, something's <laughs> wrong yeah. there. So they're they're able to do it slow. They're able to do something slowly, but the under very bit under uh, other constraints, they're not able to do it. And especially when those constraints matter, such as doing it with weight or doing it in the context of golf swing, they're not able to, to make that movement 100 okay. 100 yeah and it's like you know i use the analogy of going well you know if you're going up a mountain right you have a really you have one you have a fast way to go up a mountain but you also have a scenic route right well if you only take one way you're missing so many other things as well so if you're just trying to groove in one movement you might be missing huge amounts of opportunity to develop different things you know within your game so we've got to be kind of open to that as well we're not trying to produce one movement pattern we want an adaptable system so we can do different things that leads us to another good question we haven't talked we haven't talked much about your coach we've talked about some of the coaching theory we haven't talked about what you're coaching and i do want to get there but that leads us to another maybe controversial topic in the golf world it's, it's at least one people one that people find it fun to tweet about and argue about which is block first random practice and that's kind of and those those terms definitely need to be defined because they sometimes mean different things to different people but when you say something like we're not just trying to repeat one motor pattern we're trying to be able to work in a series of motor patterns what i hear you saying is we're not just trying to make a singular golf swing we're trying to we're trying to have what I would call like a general singular golf swing with a bunch of around it variables that we uh, we learn to adjust for because naturally we will there's there's an ideal swing and then there's oh my hands are two millimeters higher than they were last time and so I don't know that but my body's going to naturally adapt to that and we want to be able to adapt to when we accidentally get in those positions, when we quote unquote accidentally, but in- invariably end up in those positions, we want to be able to adapt our swing hundred uh, percent yeah, for those outcomes, which to me in pract in practice means that if I go to the range, I'm not just hitting seven iron draws all day, which would be something that plenty of, if I'm interpreting what you're saying, you're saying maybe don't go to the range and hit seven iron draws all day which again, something I know some people would take uh, exception with, and that's what makes these makes these types of conversations fun is to try to understand where everyone's coming from and try to meld meld that together if if possible. So kind of tell me what is that what does that portion mean to you as, as to block and random and then and feel free to define those as you, as you see fit so that we make sure we're on everyone's on the same page and then beyond that as far as like practicing with when it is applied to practice specifically like shot shapes etc what does that mean 
Well, so block. So basically, block the random is just scheduling of practice. It's nothing more than that. There's no. It's not an intervention of practice, right? So, so you have blocked, serial, and then random on like a continuum. So block would just be a block of five balls where you'd hit a seven iron or or whatnot. But within that block, you could have what they term as within skill variability. So you could move the flight up and down just within a, a block of five balls, right? So the intervention was is within that. Mm -hmm. Then you've got serial. So serial is um, different skills in a in a predetermined order. So golf is actually played is like a serial sport. It's played in a specific order. So I could then go right. I want to hit one fade with a with my driver. I'm going to hit then a, a a high fade with a seven iron, and then I'm going to hit you know a low pitch or whatnot, and then I'm going to go back and do it again. Right. So that's the that's the schedule. Random is, is no order. You just literally just throw in anything at anybody. It can be whatever, right? There's no predetermined order. So, you know, I look at them and they're just scheduling. I think that there's more to training than just those, personally. I I look at it like it, I look at it like the game when, when you're looking at a, a practice. So, you know, within that, you might have, you know, between skill variability. So between skill is, and again, it would be defined as what is a between skill. So is a is a driver, is that a different skill to a four iron, right? So that would be determined, I think it is, but because it has a different criteria to it. So that would be, if I practice a driver and then I hit that, that's within, that's, sorry, that's between skill, two different skills, okay? Within skill would be, okay, I'm going to use the same club, but I'm just going to adapt different skills. So I'm going to hit a draw, but I'm going to hit a high draw, a medium draw, and a low draw. And that's just what I'm going to do. That's more practice intervention. If you then also want to look at it, you can add in some space, Right, so you can say, okay, we're gonna. If you have the ability to move, you're gonna hit one tee shot, and you're gonna hit an approach shot, and you're gonna go hit a putt. So you're always like trying to retrieve, and and you know bring things that that are new. If you want somebody to, you know, that working on their movement for a particular shot, you can go, okay, well, what we're gonna do? We're gonna do one swing here, then you're gonna go and do a pitch and a chip and a putt, and then you're gonna come back and you're gonna see if you, can you recreate what we've been working on. That's again, that's an intervention, a practice intervention. So within blocked serial random, that's just the order. That's a schedule of practice. It's almost a mute point, to be honest, with you know the, the discussions that go on. So th does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. It's it sounds like from what you're saying, like those the the terms block random and then uh serial are essentially just that terms as far as how the practice is scheduled but what's actually going on in the practice and what you're working on is what is mo is what is important and you could do it in any of those three ways but as long Absolutely, as yeah. as long as there was some sort of what i would call variability in the practice that's probably where you're going to draw your benefits from not variability, not in the scheduling per se, but in the what's actually going on in each, yeah, movement. Yeah, and we and we have good variability and we have poor variability. You know, if we see, you know, a, a relatively new golfer, the likelihood they probably have poor variability. You know, in in how they move and whatnot, and so you're trying to kind of again parameterize that and uh, into okay, now we're in a an area of good variability where we're in kind of like this this optimum funnel of a function but the movement within that that funnel is pretty different every time and it, and it is you know there is there is slight adjustments going on constantly when we when we move we're not making the same movement over and over and over again unfortunately <laughs> if, if it was that it would be much easier i think but we do it for conserving energy as well from a physical 
from a physical standpoint. So yeah, there's a, I mean, there's a lot that goes into training a practice. And, you know, when I look at, I try and look at practice as efficiency of practice over time. So how effective are we at doing practice interventions that are going to, uh, as much as we know, like sat here right now, and this might change, you know, in a few years, different research gets done and whatnot. But as we sit right now, that's near transfer. So that's going to, anything we're doing movement-based, any drills, any tasks or whatnot, there's a level of context to it that's, that's like the game that is going to somewhat enhance transfer. And if we can consistently do that and we have real high quality trials that we're, that we're, that we're hitting or chipping or whatnot, and it has that, I want to say quality trials, that's, that's representative of the game as much as we can, over time, it's going to, I think we're going to be, have, we'll be much more efficient with our practice and we will develop, right? The difficult thing of this is this practice stuff has been around for a long time. Some, some of it to me is flawed because the research that's been done has been done in labs on finger t- tapping and, and that's just not like the real world, unfortunately. So we kind of have to look at that. It's in a controlled environment, and they, you know, they get the information out that they want to get out. We're not. We don't play sports like that, right? So we have to look at well, what does the game represent, and how can we get you to practice that's close to the game? Even if you're making some kind of swing change, you know, let's let's do it within some kind of context to what the sport is is actually giving us. Goes back to Daniel Coyle. Well, if they're playing futsal. They're getting more touches. Why do why do they do in soccer? Why do they play small pitches, small sided games? It's that principle: close down space, be able to move the ball quicker. So you're just adding these things in, but it still has context to the game. That makes sense. I think we're coming close to time, but I've we still haven't hit a few things I want to hit quickly. So let's yeah, yeah, absolutely. Those. You said you you said you became uh, you were coaching out on tour by the age of 25. Now you said. You're working on your PhD and you also or your doctorate and you're also working on you still are obviously coaching, but you probably characterize yourself more as what you said, a practice coach, like looking at what players are yeah. practicing more than making mechanical changes without looking at that. So kind of tell us quickly, starting to coach on tour at the age of 25, what that was like, how that happened for you. Um, a little bit about, I'm assuming you have a thesis for your doctorate. So what research you're doing there. And then as far as practicing and mechanical instruction, et cetera, what, how, what your role as a coach looks like? Yeah. So my role right now is more again, along the practice line. So it's helping. I work with uh, two professionals. One played Ryder cup in whistling Straits. One has just played ride a cup this year in Rome and we try and even if they're trying to make a, a technical move a change and whatnot I'll help them practice what, what to do in practice to kind of help that ultim- ultimately and then what we're looking at is just the challenges over time so we, you know we need levels of um, of practice challenge not necessarily close to tournament wise so it's kind of like a I don't really like the, I think the word periodization, but I don't think it's as periodization is not like one size fits all. It's, it's a way of just looking at what type of training we do at what time that's relative to that player. So we start, we look at that ultimately. And again, just design, help design, you know, practice for these players to try and maximize performance over time. Ultimately, what, what we're kind of interested in, um, is that so with the the doctorate it's going to be qualitative so we're going to interview some some players and we're going to try and find out what they do you know the the deep dive into you know what they're doing and like why they're doing it so their beliefs around practice as well because like i said before i think there's a lot of beliefs that we have in golf that have come from a certain time that we might have just adopted and we use it. But it's not to say that that 
that's not wrong, but there might be a more efficient way. So sometimes you need to challenge beliefs. That goes a little bit into mindset research, but you challenge their beliefs to be able to then choose a more adaptive process when they go and practice. And really my role you know, within all of this is to try and help athletes when they practice on their own, because they are on their own probably more than they're with coaches, how to make those better decisions, you know, when they wake up and they're going to go and practice for that day, you know, not to just go fall into, oh, I've always done it this way. So I'm just going to continue to do that. And that's really where, where I'm at. From a tour perspective, you know, I started out on tour just working on players mechanics and I still look into that, but that's not really where my interests lie right now. I just wish when I was first out on tour, I would have known the stuff that I'm kind of looking at now because I think I would have probably been able to make a bigger impact. So there's a little bit of, it was just that time, but when I look back, there's that element of not, not regret, but like, what, like, why didn't I, why wasn't I, you know, why didn't I hear about this stuff, you know, till, till a later point? I think it almost should be, part of our training like to to learn how to do these and understand motor learning and motor control and whatnot if we're gonna if we're focused on helping somebody move differently agreed and i think i have two more questions one of them is the last question we ask all of our guests on but i'm gonna ask this one because that opened up a great door into so as you said you've been working with tour players a while now you're focusing more on practice like still working with them, but more on the practice side and helping incorporate mechanical changes via practice. But what is, and you talked also about periodization and how it's variable for every player. But if we had to speak in generalities, let's kind of talk about the essentially the week of a tournament player. Let's talk about the week of a tournament quickly. And then let's say there's an off week, but not in the off season. What does, practice look like or if you were just advising if i if you say i had to give a general plan for what to be doing the week of a tournament called a thursday through saturday or thursday through sunday tournament if i had to give a general plan for what you should be doing starting on monday here's what i would be saying and then if we're in an off week between tournament uh between tournaments so we're free monday through the next sunday what does the general plan look like? Yeah, I mean, it, it does. Yeah, it does differ for for a lot of players because they they like have different thresholds that they like. But primarily at tournaments, I would say it's um, low in complexity, so we don't want to use up too much. You know, we've got to be ready for Sunday afternoon, really. So we don't want to make it like overly demanding, overly challenge based. It's almost like going through the armory that the player is going to have for that week. And really, um, I call this performance preparation. So they're getting ready for that golf course that week. What type of shots are they going to have? Where's the volume of shots into the green? What do the tee shots require? And start to just prepare for that, basically. Not very complex. I don't like the idea of having to change or do... I don't really want anything new happening. Or like from a change perspective during a tournament, because um, I think that takes up way too much energy. Personally, then you have a different in an off week. You know, obviously you need some rest and recovery going on. But this is what I feel that golfers fall a little bit short on. They don't have enough challenge in in their off weeks. Everything is too comfortable, and if we don't have challenge and to do, and to do challenge. Sometimes it's hard when we're on our own. That's so. Sometimes that's when I come on board to help you know, build some tasks and challenge tasks that they can implement into their into their off weeks, which is sort of like moving them in the direction of what their kind of goals and aspirations are. So there's, we're trying to elevate. We're trying to, yeah, basically trying to. Look at again their coord. Let's say it's a coordination thing, you know, which is kind of movement. You're challenging that. You're doing that on diff on the golf course. You might just be doing a pure challenge task 
which has a higher level or more demanding than than what they used to. And that, and then as you start to get back to the tournament, you start to like drop it off again. So you start to like taper it off a little bit. So that would be kind of a general. What goes into it would be very different for different players. And and the challenge, some some players I work with like challenge closer to tournaments because it starts to get them going. Some would like would rather challenge at the other other, other end of the week. And then as they start to get closer, it's becoming less challenged. So it's it's you know it varies, and we, we kind of find out what the what the tolerance the players have for for this kind of stuff. That is helpful. Well, we appreciate you joining us. The last question we ask every guest is the same, which is if you could go back to yourself as a junior golfer and tell yourself just one thing, what would that one thing be? And then for you, could you still work with golfers in that role? Tell us if you could tell a junior golfer just one thing, what would that one thing be? One thing I tell a junior golfer is look at development over time rather than just, you know, the performance pressures like too imminent. You know, it's like look at constant development, basically. Little bits, little bits, little bits, little bits. If I was to go back, think in my junior days, I grew up on a really short golf course. So it would be hit driver more often, <laughs> develop more speed, because that's just the way the game is right now. That's the truth. Well, thank you for joining us. If people are trying to find you on social media, trying to learn more about you, all that kind of stuff, where can they find you, work with you, all that? So I'm um, probably best on Instagram, which is Stuart M Coaching. But I'll what I'll do, I'll you have my email address. I'm happy just put that in the show notes or or wherever. Cause if somebody wants to reach out to me via email then with with something, then I'm I'm happy to to do that and happy to chat. To, to anybody if they want to kind of progress in this area be sure to check out Stuart on social media if you're listening to this on apple Podcasts or spotify please subscribe and leave a rating if you're listening on youtube please like and subscribe and if you're listening to us right now all i ask you to remember is remember the golfer's agreement please do that and then if you're trying to find us on instagram you can find us there at the tournament code and on twitter slash x tournament code as always, we appreciate you joining us and look forward to diving in deeper to what it takes to play elite tournament golf. 